Go Paul. So uh, Craig Baumann, who is um, uh, principal of uh, bitemporaldata.com. Thank you, Peter. So as uh, Peter mentioned, I'm going to be talking about bitemporal data today and uh, specifically um, second generation bitemporal data solutions, which we're referring to as bitemp 2.0. I'm going to be speaking about uh, some of the hype around bitemporal data and bitemp 2.0, as well as some of the barriers for adoption and also some of the steps that I think the company should be taking at this time related to this technology. What do I uh, push here? Push the right. Okay. So before we jump into the, uh, the hype around uh, bitemporal data and bitemp 2.0, I think first uh, a little bit of background on the hype around temporal data in general is a, uh, is a good thing to cover. And one thing that we need to keep in mind or we need to remember, I think, is that relational theory, which is the basis for so much of what we do in data architecture and database design and database implementation, doesn't have any real explicit support for temporal data or data which changes over time or historical data. Uh, second, the SQL language, the SQL language, hasn't had any explicit or real explicit support for temporal data. And I think the third point that we need to keep in mind is that a lot of what we use databases for today does have a lot to do with temporal data. Time series databases, all about temporal data. Um, data warehousing, decision support, dimensional modeling, all about temporal data. And there's just a whole host of different methodologies and design techniques and products which are all oriented towards helping us to work with and utilize temporal data. I mentioned this, uh, this background so that you can appreciate why a lot of folks, myself included, think it's a pretty big deal that right now we are on the cusp for the first time of having temporal extensions added to standard SQL or to ANSI ISO SQL. I also mentioned this background so that you can appreciate that a lot of folks think it's a big deal, myself included, that database vendors are beginning to integrate the functional support for these extensions into their database engines or into the kernels of their database products. So where the, uh, the summary of the hype around temporal data in general for me is that this combination of standard syntax for working with temporal data and the integration of support for that into database engines really seems to be an enabler for new ways of designing databases and utilizing database technology. And there's a lot of potential benefits for this, from new functionality to developer productivity to, uh, to performance. So there's a lot of promise in the, uh, the combination of these uh, advances. Now about the, uh, the hype around bitemporal data. Again, I think a little bit of background is helpful here. And first, I think that we need to keep in mind that these new temporal extensions include support for the, um, the valid or the business dimension of time this is also sometimes referred to as what we knew from a business perspective. These new temporal extensions also include support for the transaction or database dimension of time, which is also sometimes referred to as when you knew it from a database perspective. Together, they give us bitemporal data or support for what you knew and when you knew it. Another way of thinking about bitemporal data is that it gives us a history of how history from a business perspective was stored in the database. I think the best way to express the hype around bitemporal data, though, is in, in terms of what only bitemporal data can do for you. And so only bitemporal data can give you full support for corrections. And by this, I mean a history of corrections to data at past, current, and future business times. Only bitemporal data can give you a complete history or audit trail of what you knew and when you knew it. Only bitemporal data can give you a reproducible business perspective history as you knew it at any point in time. These are pretty strong statements. I think they can be backed up, and I think it's probably pretty obvious the implications here from a regulatory point of view, from a risk management point of view, and also just from a general decision-making point of view. So now, having introduced a little bit more, or given a little bit more background on bitemporal data, I can tell you more specifically what bitemp 2.0 is to me. And so specifically what bitemp 2.0 is, I think, is 
the combination of this standardized syntax for bitemporal data and the integration of support for that syntax into database engines. That is Bitemp 2.0. A little bit about the, uh, the barriers to adoption and success in utilizing this technology. I think there really are two categories here that we can think about. One is complexity and the other is performance. On the complexity front, we need to, uh, to understand that there is some complexity involved in these temporal extensions, but I think there's a lot of good things happening on this front. I think that we're getting some syntax which is helping to isolate or insulate us from some of that complexity, especially the users and the developers don't need to be exposed to it. Um, and I think we're also just getting more and better educational materials and explanations and that type of thing becoming available in this space. On the performance front, I think, uh, you know, a few points are as one is that performance concerns are justified. But I think we need to remember the context of this is that usually the context of this is, is in comparing bitemporal solutions to less functional solutions. So we can certainly give you faster solutions which don't provide those things that I mentioned that only bitemp, bitemporal data can do for you. Uh, and then the last point around performance I'd like to make is that, you know, I've seen in the past a lot of what I refer to as fear-based decision-making around deployment of bitemporal data. And I think that at this time we know enough, we have enough information, we understand bitemporal data performance characteristics enough that we need to move away from that type of environment more towards what I refer to as fact-based deployments. And what are fact-based deployments? It's implementing bitemporal data solutions with our eyes open, understanding the performance characteristics and applying it to the appropriate business areas and projects and use cases. Next, very quickly, on the actions that I think the company should be taking related to, uh, to this technology is that, one, if you or your organization isn't already have a basic familiarity with bitemporal data and with these temporal extensions, this is the time to get on the, uh, the learning curve. Um, you know, so I would really encourage people to begin to get this basic understanding. Next thing that I think companies should be doing and looking at is beginning to evaluate different vendors' solutions in this space and what they're doing. Bring in your favorite vendors, bring in multiple vendors and put them against comparable functional or performance test cases and see how they compare. It can be a very educational and very, uh, very interesting project to do at this time. We've had a lot of success in that type of project. Uh, next, companies can move down up the food chain to proof of concept type of projects. There's no substitute for working with your data model and your data and your use cases to really explore and to understand the promises of this, these new technology developments as well as the potential performance issues, uh, et cetera, may come into play as applied to your specific use cases again. Then the last thing I think that companies need to be doing on this front is I think there still is this thing that I refer to as the bitemporal data performance boogeyman in the room here. People are still scared at a certain level of putting their career on the line by using this type of technology. And I think, you know, we need to get this, this guy, the boogeyman, out of the room. And the best way to do that is by having good performance benchmarks, good performance tests that people can really utilize and apply and, and help to understand, um, you know, these performance characteristics. So again, we can move from this fear-based decision-making to this fact-based deployment. So that's what I have here, and now I'd like to uh, turn it over to my friend Paul, and he's going to talk about how this hype and these barriers fit into the famous Gartner hype curve.